Evening, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Delaware Pavilion. Uh, lovely to see such a great turnout this evening, uh, particular thanks to our members and patrons for their continued support. Um, I won't repeat what's on the screen for you, and I'll allow you to read that unless anyone wants me to. Um, but it's a very interesting um, it's a very interesting piece of academia um, that um, that Stephen is working on uh, about the, the the music in Hastings and, and the surrounding region in, in that period between 1916 and 1985. Um, I, had the, I was lucky enough to sit and chat with Stephen uh, last week, um, and it is fascinating. Uh, the stories, the anecdotes, everything about it is absolutely fascinating. Um, and I know you will have a lot of questions. Uh, I had about a dozen, um, which Stephen was very kind to, uh, to, to respond to me on. Um, but what we're going to do, so I'm going to actually introduce myself. I'm Ed, the head of librarian here at the Delaware Village. Um, but what we're going to do is, if we can politely um, hold those questions, uh, Stephen will work, work through some of his some of his findings, uh, some, of, some, of, some of his workings um, for you for about 45 minutes. Um, and then if you can kindly hold off any questions, what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll let Stephen uh, show you some of his workings, and then we'll take a short break, uh, grab a drink, uh, if you like, and then we'll come back and take the questions after that point, if that's okay. So you can just make a mental note of any questions um, while Stephen's speaking, uh, to allow him to flow <laughs> through his journey. Um, okay, uh, I'm sure you'll find it as fascinating as I did. Um, welcome, please welcome Stephen. Thanks very much, Ed. Um, well, thanks a lot for coming. Um, it, is, it, is, it is academic research, but what I'm hoping is I've, 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 I've pre prepared the talk in a way that will be accessible to everyone. You know, it's not just about academia, it's about the history of this incredible area and the importance of this, the music history of this particular area. So, as Ed said, I'm going to talk for about 45, maybe 50 minutes. Um, I'm going to play some, a bits of music. If you want to clap, sing along, tap your feet, feel free. Um, there's a couple of clips. Um, which I, think, which I think are interesting as well. And I, hopefully there'll be some things that you won't know about. There are people in this room that know far more about the popular music histories of Hastings than I do. But hopefully I've found out a few things that they don't know about and um, I'll be talking about that. But I thought I might start um, uh, with this, with a short clip, just to kind of put me in the mood. This is, um, this is uh, Don Partridge from um, 1968, his song Rosie. Like that. Yeah. yeah. So, right. so that hit that got to number four in the charts in 1968. But probably what you don't know is that um, he actually wrote the song in Hastings, and um, he's he's a quite quirky character, Don Partridge. And um, he was born in Bournemouth. He left school when he was 15, and he became a burglar. <laughs> so after becoming a burglar, he, he had over 60 jobs by the time he was by the time he was 21, and. Um, he was, he was probably his most famous antic was he, 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 he made some wings and he, he jumped off Hammersmith Bridge in London because he thought he, he'd be able to fly, but clearly he wasn't able to fly. So he then turned to music and um, he decided to become a, a one-man band. You know, he was, a, he was called King of the Buskers and um, he actually came to Hastings to get his drum built. So he, um, he had this drum that he used to operate on a piece of... It's a you know, piece of string with his foot on his back. But the actual drum was made by a guy called Andy Durr in Hastings. And um, it charged him £12 for building this, this drum. And of course, Rosie went on to be a massive hit. He recorded it for £6 um, in, a, in a studio in Brewer Street in Soho. And um, it raised about 50000 which is I think about £800,000 in today's money. So. 
he had a connection to Hastings, and he also played, um, there used to be a, a folk club at the Nelson pub. He ran for six years, up to 1968, um, and um, he played there on uh, Sunday the 5th of February, 67, and um, he was the star act. And uh, I like to think that maybe it was that evening that inspired him to write the song. <laughs> okay, so, um, over the next say, few minutes, I'm going to give you a little bit of background and context. You know, why did I end up doing this? Um, and why study popular music and why Hastings? Um, the geographical scope of the study, as Ed mentioned, Hastings is really very important. I mean, the obvious examples are Hastings Pier, um, which dropped a nightclub, the Crypt, and, and many more venues. Um, but this building played an important part as well, as did the, the folk club in Tellum. Um, as did the Hayloft folk club in Fairlight. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the geographical scope of the study. Um, the research question is really, what am I trying to find out? You know, this is, a, this is a piece of doctoral research which hopefully will result in a PhD. And um, I need to find some stuff out. You know, what's happening here? There's something very special happening in this area. And it's been happening in this area for a very long time. I'll explain, the methodology is really just about how I'm going about doing this. Um, the, the journey, you know, what it's been like over the last couple of years. Um, some sort of analysis, that are, um, some of the emerging themes that have come out that start to explain why this is such a vibrant area musically. What remains to be done? Um, the impact that this piece of research will have, which hopefully will be a real positive contribution to this area. Um, and it's funny, a Q&A after we've had a short break. Um, just a little bit about um, where I'm studying. So the London College of Music is one of nine um, schools from the University of West London. And it's the largest specialist music and performing arts institution in the UK. Um, it was formerly um, Ealing Art College. And uh, some interesting people studied there. So Ray Davis, The Kinks, Freddie Mercury, uh, the Queen, of course, Pete Townsend, <laughs> Who, um, Ronnie Wood, The Faces, and more recently, the Rolling Stones. Well, not recently. And Little Sims, who actually studied music management at, um, at my university uh, about three or four years ago. And um, he's what, again, this connection. Um, Little Sims has been nominated for a Mercury Prize, as have the Nova Twins. Who, are now, who now live in Hastings. So, I just thought, I, I hope you find this interesting. It's a bit self-indulgent, but um, there's, a, there's something that end, I ended up here, you know, after a sequence of events. And um, I was working, um, I was working in criminal justice. I worked in criminal justice for quite a long time. And um, I was working in Eastern Europe. I really didn't enjoy it at all. And um, I was working in Sofia in Bulgaria in 2011, and someone said to me, you should, you should take a walk up Mount Vitosha, it's beautiful. You know, I don't like heights, and, and, and uh, you know, why I did it, I don't know, I eventually got to the top of this mountain. And um, I had kind of epiphany, and, um, and, and I just thought I didn't want to do this job anymore. And I got back to my office on the Monday night, and I handed in my notice. And the, the next sort of big event in this kind of journey, I carried on working in criminal justice, but I just, you know, on a freelance basis, just, you know, just wasn't enjoying it. And then I went to see um, a talk by Richard Coles. And some of you know Richard Coles from, from TV. He was on um, Strictly Come Dancing in 2017. And, uh, you know, he, he hosts Saturday Live on Radio 4. And, um, and, and he, he, it was a really interesting talk. It was a, and uh, he talked about his time in the Commune Arts with Jimmy Samuel and, and he talked a lot about some of the work he did um, with, with Red Wedge over the, during the 80s and he was the consultant for the film Pride. It was a really interesting talk and afterwards I decided to buy his book, which was, uh, which is, this is this, which is called um, Fabulous Riches or How I Went From Pop to Pulpit. You know, he went from being a, you know, very successful musician to, a, you know, to a vicar and um, I was very really interested in that and I, um, I met him afterwards I bought his book, and um, I said to him, you know, this, you know, this you know, obviously spirituality is very important to you. And, um, and he said, yeah, and I said, well, how, do you, how, do you, how do you get it? And he said, well, what I would do is, 
And he said, come and sit in the back of a few churches. He said, see how you feel. And he said, that's some work. Maybe go on a retreat. So when I got home, I, bo I booked a flight to Rome. Because so I thought, I thought, um, I thought what I'd do is I'd start. I'd start with uh, some pizza. So I had a week, I had a week, I had an Airbnb in, in Rome. I went to, I flew to Rome. And um, it was really interesting. You know, I sat in lots of churches. I really enjoyed it. I found it very peaceful. I lit candles. And, um, you know, and it was, it was great. And then I came back and, um, and my partner Sarah told me about one of our neighbours who'd been to India to this ashram in, in Goa. I thought, that, that might be the answer. That might be the answer. Yeah. <laughs> True. So I, actually, I, went, I went to Goa in the end of 2015. For, I went on my own for, I was there for nearly a month. And um, it was really life changing. I came back and I, and I stopped doing any, I stopped doing all my true justice work. And um, I really wasn't sure what to do. And um, Sarah found me this course in Liverpool. And um, um, the Beatles, popular music in society, thought, wow, this is just the perfect thing for me. So I spent two years studying musicology in Liverpool. And when it came to my dissertation, I decided to write about Hastings Pier. And um, you know, I was encouraged to write about the Beatles. I love the Beatles. But you know, I felt there'd been a lot of people writing about the Beatles for a long, long time. And so I, I wrote about Hastings Pier. I actually wrote about the night that Jimi Hendrix played on Hastings Pier. And I spent a huge amount of time in Hastings Public Library, just researching and reading. It was just, became really immersed in it and fascinated by it. And, um, and then I was really lucky um, to be offered the opportunity by, by the London College of Music to do a three-year study of, of Hastings Music. And you, you saw the title of my PhD that year. <coughs> So why Hastings? You know, what, what is it about Hastings? I, I, I just, I'm playing another little clip. Please don't be shy if you want to sing along to this, if you like it. But um, I, my first introduction to live popular music was on the 31st of August 1969. And I went to see the foundations um, on Hastings Pier, the Hastings Pier Ballroom. It said actually the foundation in the Hastings Observer clip. <laughs> It's actually, they were, they were the foundations. And, and I went with a friend of mine, Bern, Bernard Jeffrey, and um, I think we were about 14 at the time, and we, we snuck in, we saw the foundations. And it was just the most fantastic thing. You know, everybody in those days used to watch Toggle Pops. You know, it was, you know, I don't know how many million, I probably written it down somewhere, how many millions of people watched Toggle Pops. And you know, think on a Thursday you'd watch Toggle Pops, and then you know, the band that you'd seen on Thursday would be appearing live on Hastings Pier Ballroom. It seemed amazing. So this was my first introduction to uh, live popular music. This was actually recorded for a German television show a couple of months after they played on Hastings Pier. Hope you like it. Okay, I just wanted to talk a bit about the um, the culture of music here today. Now, you know, I mean, I'd, like probably some of you here were at the gig on Friday, the Kid Capucci yeah. gig. Absolutely exhilarating. You know, this this is an amazing band who are fiercely proud to come from this town. That's them in the background there. And um, unlike other well-known music towns such as Liverpool. And Manchester, Nashville, um, Hastings and the surrounding area, you know, it's not, um, you know, it's not the centre of music production. There's no particularly famous musicians that come here from here. Yet it's got this heritage that's really, I don't think there's anything like it anywhere else in the country. And, um, and music is very much central to its identity. You know, I, I mean, I just saw, I think it was in yesterday, at the Voodoo Festival, just announced, and I, I'm sure the Voodoo Festival in Hastings will be accompanied by music. It won't just be a Voodoo Festival, I'm sure. Um, and geographical areas throughout the world have capitalised on this music, music heritage. And um, in fact, Hastings Bar Council looked into this in, in 20, I think it was 2016, and they published their, and they used a, a consultancy firm called Drury McPherson. Drew McPherson concluded that it was an incredibly important, this, the popular music heritage of this area is an incredibly important part of people's sense of identity. It's something they're very fiercely proud of. 
And um, but they didn't take that forward. And you know, and I, I the, one of the things that I have emerged from my um, from my research is how much integrity this area has got. You know, I'm not being critical of, in any way of Liverpool. It's Liverpool, you know, it's, it's an amazing city with an amazing musical heritage. But you know, it, it is the Beatles. You know, the Beatles is, is very prominent in in, in in Liverpool. I mean, I think when I when I was last there, somebody told me that ten percent of the working population in Liverpool do some work connected to the Beatles, whether it be in a museum, heritage tour, or a hotel. You know, and and, and of course, it was important for, for Liverpool to bounce back from from <laughs> it was a really difficult time for them, socially and economically. But Hastings didn't do that. I think it could have done. I think it still could. But in a way, I hope it doesn't, because I think it, it leaves Hastings in a very different and very unique position. And um, so, this, so this study really isn't about, um, it's not about the sort of the fiscal benefits of, of, of popular music. It's, a, it's, a, it's a really about the way that popular music benefits the community as social capital, and the way that live music enhances a sense of belonging and allows people to connect with each other. You know, the fact that you're all here shows that you're interested in this subject. The fact that, you know, I think the Delaware sold out, in my mind, did you sell out last Friday? I think you probably did. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. yeah. it's just a fantastic evening. So. Okay. <laughs> um, I'd like to play a little clip. Um, this is the this is of Suggs, of Magnus. This, I saw, this was in 2016. And, and some of you may know, he, he nailed the last plank into the pier after it was refurbished. And he was interviewed about Hastings and about his memories of Hastings. He lived here till he was four, so obviously he doesn't have many memories, but he has, he has some. And I just wanted to play this clip because I think this clip's important. Very vague ones. I mean, I left when I was about four, but you know, for, for sure I can remember coming along this pier as a kid because everybody did, yeah. Um, I must still come back a lot. I've got a lot of friends who live down here, and uh, it's a great place, Hastings, yeah. In fact, I'm going to see a friend of mine called Axilla, I don't know if you know, he's a DJ. <laughs> he was telling me that there was a survey from Goldsmiths Art College or something that there's more music per square inch in Hastings than anywhere in the country, which I'm very excited about. I shouldn't sound surprised, but. I don't think you can say that about Morecambe or Worthing, yeah. as lovely as they are. So I'm looking forward to talking. To, to, you said there's just a very vibrant music scene down here, yeah. especially in the pubs and all that. Yeah, I was saying, you know, the, the, the saddest thing of, of its demise was that it was when we were at our sort of prime. And in fact, we did a seaside tour playing all the places we could around the coast, but of course, this pier wasn't operating then, so we never got a chance to play. So it's a marvellous thing to be able to play in now. There was a lot of sort of quizzical expressions, you know, it's like, the very first of all, you know, Clapham Common, Hastings Pier, <laughs> put this in. <laughs> well, it was worn into the pier act, get on with it. <laughs> so, so that's Suggs talking about, about Hastings. And he refers to a study by Goldsmith Art College. and. Um, this is the most fascinating piece of work academically because Goldsmiths carried out this piece of research um, in around 20, I think 13, and I think they published it in 2014. And um, this is a busy slide, there's a lot going on here, and it's quite difficult to explain. But they, they interviewed 147,633 people. And, um, they asked them the 38 questions. And these, the, the aim of these questions was to try and establish musicality around the UK. You know, when I say the UK, that's I think 379 local authorities around the UK. And, uh, sorry, Britain, it wasn't, didn't, didn't include Northern Ireland. And um, they asked um, a broad range of questions to try and work out where, where, was, where was all the music coming from? Where was music important? And some of the questions they asked, they, you know, they were asking, how much income do you spend on music? Do you write about music? How many music events do you attend? Um, how much time do you spend listening to music? How much time do you spend reading about music? Um, 
Do you play music? Can you play a musical instrument? Can you read music? And so on and so forth. Right down to how, how, how does music affect you? You know, does it sound shivers down your spine? Those were the <coughs> questions they asked 100 and, what's the system I did? I say 147,000 people. And um, this was the result. So the result was that Hastings has the highest level of musical sophistication <laughs> in the whole UK. And I think what I thought was particularly interesting about it was Liverpool and Manchester are on that list, you know, which, which really surprised me. And the other thing that Goldsmiths kind of felt was, 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 was unusual was that there's usually a direct correlation between musical sophistication and, and wealth. You know, this, this, is, this isn't a wealthy area, yet it's got the highest level of musical sophistication in the UK. And the reason why there's a correlation between wealth and, and musical sophistication is because people can afford to send their kids to, you know, clarinet lessons, they can afford to go and see gigs, they can afford, they can afford to spend their money on music. But that, that's, I'm not suggesting people don't spend money on music in this area, but it's not the reason why it's the most musically sophisticated part of the country. I, I think that was, that was a real groundbreaking piece of, um, of, of research for me. I, I, someone who can't be here today, Andy Gunton, um, who's become a good friend, who's on holiday at the moment, but he told me about the Suggs. I didn't know about the Suggs interview until he told me, and that led me... One of the things that happens with research is you go down lots of rabbit holes. You know, some take you somewhere, some don't take you anywhere. But that one really took me somewhere. I think it's a really important, really important piece of... Of information. So this was the geographical scope of my study, and um, like, I, like I mentioned earlier, the, the geographical boundaries I realised were quite important. You know, there was so much going on within this area. There was a lot going on at the Delaware Pavilion. You know, clearly Hastings Pier had the big names, but the Delaware also had some interesting stuff going on, and it actually, in some respects, was was kind of ahead of the game and was putting on, you know, pop shows back in 1960. So there was a lot going on here, but equally important is the Black Horse Folk Club in Tellum, which is probably the top of that arc. Like, there was just incredible musicians that played there. You know, like, I had this conversation with, with Ed recently, you know, Christy Moore played. You know, I think Christy Moore played the Black Horse and, and the Hayloft, which is in Fairline. You know, Christy Moore would sell, sell out the Royal Albert Hall. You know, so there's some, some important musicians that, that played in this across that whole area. So the Bell War. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the Bell War started off um, mainly mainly providing entertainment for an older demographic. You know, dance bands were incredibly important here. Um, musical theatre was important. Um, pantomime. It was it was general um, light light orchestral music, light entertainment, really. The sort of kind of Saturday night TV stuff. The sort of thing actually was also happening at White Rock when it was White Rock Pavilion. So you know you'd see it might be you know Ken Dodd or it, it, it could be it, it could be, it'd be something occasionally jazz, but usually on the whole light entertainment. But that started to shift around 1964. There were some exceptions. There was the Marty Wilder show, um, Cliff Richard and the Shadows played here. This is 1960, and um, but the but the Delaware responded quite quickly. And by 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 about 1964, it was hosting these regular events. Sorry, 67, uh, the Beat Raves. And this is a, a picture of um, a Clockwork Orange, who were a local band. Who some of you may, may may not know. This is another bit of information I found out, which I thought was interesting. Neil Christian and the Crusaders played at the Delaware. They also played at the Witch Doctor Nightclub, which I'll talk about in a bit. And um, Neil Christian and the Crusaders were formed from Reddy Lewis and the Red Cats. And their guitarist was Jimmy Page, Led Zeppelin. Now, I don't know whether Jimmy Page played here. I've actually written to him and asked him if he, if he remembers, but he hasn't replied yet. <laughs> um, but um, but they, they played, he, he was in this band for four years. He only stopped playing when he got glamour fever. On the, on the van driving around the country and he decided to, 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 to stop doing it. But um, yeah, the Christian and the Crusaders. Um, but also, you know, there were lots of um, musicians who became actually quite well known. 
but they were not necessarily in the big name bands that were playing on the like the Kinks or the, or the Who, but, but they were good, solid bands that were playing here. What was not happening very much is there wasn't much what I would call collaboration between the two, which is a shame really. The only one I could find was um, was in, I think it was 85, Ozabisa played at the pier, and then six months later they played the Delaware Pavilion. Okay, so you're going to rec I think you're going to, I don't mean to shout out, but you'll recognise a lot of these places. But the, the, the places that bands and musicians played across this area were so important and remain important. And uh, I'll put a few of them up on the screen. And uh, the Ridge Hotel. And uh, what's the next one? Hayloft Folk Club. Now this is this this went through a number of this is the marinas this is the azure now I think and uh, it was a, it was the sun lounge marina pavilion and uh, that was an important place. Um, next is uh, Hastings Old Town Folk Club, which was at the Nelson. I don't know if you remember the do you remember the swimming pool? Jams was played virtually every Friday. Shoot for a lot of this bit research bit at the swim at the bathing pool. Right at the end, it was all kind of right at the end of it. And um, I jumped off that that top swim, that, that top diving board once. It's the scariest thing I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> um, Black Horse Folk Club in Telham, of course. Um, the ABC Cinema, which, which hosted lots of the early shows. People, you know, people like you know um, Cliff Richard and the Shadows played there. And um, Marty Wilde played there, Billy Fury played there, Helen Shapiro played there. Shunters in Bex Hill. Shunters in Bex Hill had a really lively rock night. Used to used to be a, a regular weekly event. <coughs> Obviously the uh, White Rock Pavilion, um, then it became White Rock Theatre. Um, the Aquarius Nightclub. Unbelievable bands that played at the Aquarius. Particularly soul bands, you know, people like Arthur Conley. You know, um, Mary, Mary, you know, Mary, Mary, you know, Mary Wells. They're just astonishing. And um, Edwin Starr, the Elgins, all played at the Aquarius. Um, where's this? Mr. Cherries. Mr. Cherries. One of the guys I interviewed spoke so passionately about Mr. Cherries and said it was the most important venue in this area. I know it was important, and I think this was probably in the latter stages of my, latter part of my research period, but certainly in the 80s, Mr. Cherry's was a really thriving venue for popular music. Benitas. Now I know Benitas were maybe a maybe a nightclub. But certainly but there were bands that played. And uh, this is this is Stallion who were an important band in Hastings in the 70s. Um, this is Hastings Pilot Field. I'll talk a little bit about that football ground. Um, Pier of course. The Stables Theatre. Jake Thackeray played the Stables Theatre. Jake Thackeray was a kind of well-known folk musician. He played, played, played the Stables many times. And, um, the Carlisle Hotel. Carlisle used to be ballroom dancing. It was ballroom people. You know, now, now it's a biker's park. So, so it's changed. It's changed quite a lot. Um, the Caves. Now, one of the people I interviewed. It was delightful. It was a delightful interview with a lady who's, who's now 90, probably 92 now. And she said, it was the happiest days of my life. Go and see jazz in the caves. <laughs> ABC Cinema. Uh, the Stag. Fallows Hall. Here at Delaware. And finally in Marine Court, where there were Two kind of there were three venues there actually. There was the Grenadier Club, which was a kind of gentleman's club, I think. Yeah. Uh, then there was the uh, there was the Dolphin Ballroom, and, and then there was the Witch Doctor, which then became the Cobra. It, no, no, it would be impossible to do to do a, any kind of study uh, into Hastings popular music without focusing on the Hastings Pier Ballroom. It's just in, such an important thing, and. Um, Delighted that Archie Lockland's with us this evening, and he's very kindly allowed me to show a very short part of his fantastic 2016 documentary film *Appear*. Um, this is taken from the trailer. Um, this is not shown.
initially as a music fan, I was stunned by the list of bands who brought the ballroom over the decades. The Hastings Pier Ballroom is a lens through which you can view the entire history of British popular music. I think it's that important. January 1968, Pink Floyd were in total meltdown, really. And um, Hastings was particularly special because it was the last time we played the city. Why is my connection with Hastings Pair? Well, I played there with the Sex Pistols in sort of mid 1976. <laughs> the sound runs through up, the back doors flew open, and the stones jumped out and run like hell down the side, you know? And I still, I still can see that very, very vividly. Just kind of wanted to re-emphasise what Matt Brennan said in that in that uh, short clip. So Matt, Matt Brennan's um, associate professor at Glasgow <coughs> University. I think when when Archie interviewed him, I think he was at Edinburgh. And um, Hastings Pier Ballroom is a lens through which you can view the entire history of British popular music. I think it's that important. It, it is that important. But also, what I think is there are other venues that are also very important. And um, I want to talk quickly about the Witch Doctor. So the Witch Doctor, the Witch Doctor nightclub was part of Marie Court. You know, not many of you know, probably many of you went there, but it's, um, it's opposite the Azure. I think it was on the first or the second floor in the end. And um, it just hosted so many incredible artists that played there. And um, I mean, David Bowie played there on several occasions three times as David Jones and one, once as David Bowie. But you know, but who played there? Who played there twice actually? Once they played play here twice, once on the or several times on the pier, but they also played the Witch Doctor. I'm going to show you play you a, a short clip which is a bit quite insightful and um, it's Pete Townsend talking about the Who, but it's actually a clip of the night they played um, at the Cobweb, which was the twenty third of February <coughs> Nineteen sixty-five. Sorry. Yeah, sixty. Is it sixty-eight? No, it can't be. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. I'll come back to you there. I don't think that's right. I think it was earlier. Sixty-five. Was it sixty? Yeah, it's up there. Well, thank you. Yeah. Well spotted, Colin. Really interesting what he says about the bar actually. And, um, so here's a this is a list of um, you know what I'm really trying to find out. You know what it, what is it? You know part of this process is what are your research questions? So um, what does live pop music contribute to community life in Hastings? How pop, how important is live popular music to the cultural identity of the town? Is it shaped by any particular genre of popular music? And how do the live performances of the past influence live music performance in Hastings today? And does it really matter? And um, I think what I've realised is it wasn't just it wasn't just the big bands that played here as, as, as important as they were. There were so many original, innovative bands that were that musicians and songwriters that were here throughout that research period. I've just jotted a few down, and I, 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 it, this is by no means complete, but you know, I include people like Spike, Factory, Stallion, Muller, The Hollywood Killers, The Dave Holt Swintet, Tellum Tinkers, Jazz Cabiners, The Escalators, Die Laughing, Expanders, Teen Beats, Felix, Samson, The Deep Purple, Jim, Jim and the Jims, <laughs> Prince McBride, and, and many, many more. And, um, and that tradition continues today. You know, there's some incredible musicians music coming from this town. You know, for example, like Keith Capici we talked about, Hot Wax, um, you know, Air Called, um, Jason McNiff. There's just so much rich and innovative music coming out of this town. And um, but I also want to mention the DJs uh, who performed alongside many of the bands. I've mentioned including Johnny Mason, Colin Bell, Chris Gentry, Johnny Francis, Steve Maxted, um, some, of, some are here this evening. Um, 
My study is about live music performance, but the importance of a DJ to the local music scene cannot be underestimated. <coughs> I'm not going to go into much detail here because it's you know it's a bit dry, but um, I'm, what I'm doing is what's called a mixed method. So I'm doing quantitative research and qualitative research. All quantitative means really is you can count it. Quality is, is different. Quality is much deeper, and that's come about through through interviewing people. Um, I don't think any of us could have expected COVID, and um, it had really big impact on my work. You know, I signed a contract with my university to do this in three years, and I was getting, starting to get very concerned because um, local libraries and other archival resources were not available. Um, literature was difficult to access. Um, there were no live music performances to study. And I was unable to conduct face-to-face -face participant interviews. And there was a reluctance by participants to engage with other forms of, of interviews, such as Zoom or, or telephone. And to be honest, so was I. You know, it really wasn't what I wanted to do. Part of the reason I wanted to do this is because I kind of wanted to immerse myself <coughs> In, in Hastings and this area, and, and that's why, you know, I started doing it. And um, I couldn't travel from London, you know, I wasn't, wasn't allowed to do that. But I managed to sort of adapt, so I used the British Library newspaper archives in London and in Yorkshire, Boston's Bar, when they were open. I used electronic journal articles, I bought books, um, and I conducted what's now called a netnography which is a study of Hastings Beatles Day, which was actually done, um, it was done online in, 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 in 2021. Um, and using community radio archives, um, particularly those from Conquest Hospital Radio, um, the Johnny Mason show, hosted on Mixcloud, really to, to, to listen to interviews with local musicians and music fans, and, um, and to transcribe them, and to use social media um, to build those relationships for when sort of lockdown ended. So, you know, I mentioned um, the need to adapt to COVID, to, to COVID challenges. Um, th th do you know, there's nothing written about Hastings, hardly at all, or this area. There's, there's no academic literature, which is astonishing when you consider how important it was. I managed to find two, two books. Um, there's a chapter written by Andre Palfrey Martin in A Peer Without Peer, which is fantastic. A whole chapter called Memories of a Music Maker, which is really great. And, um, and the Hastings Old Town Music Scene. That's the only literature I could find about this area. If you know of any more, please let me know. But, you know, I obviously researched other things, but Hastings is very light when it comes to serious literature about it. Thank goodness for the Nine Battles website, which, which Alan Estelle hosts and, and provides such a rich source of, of information. Um, what I did do is I, I went through 816 copies of the Hastings Observer. I couldn't, I couldn't do it in the library because the microfiche wasn't, you know, we weren't allowed in during lockdown. And I, I, I put up, uh, there's a hundred, I, I entered 160,000 bits of data into Excel spreadsheets, uh, which, was, which was quite time consuming, still is, so still time consuming. I also did, I was able to do 15 face-to-face -face interviews, which were brilliant, and as I mentioned, I managed to transcribe 10 radio interviews. I also did an ethnography, all my ethnography, all ethnography means is really a study of people. And, and, and I chose to do Jazz Breakfast that Leanne Carroll um, performed last year, which was, which was a really great experience. I've mentioned, uh, I haven't mentioned an ethnography yet. Um, I also did um, an ethnography, a study of the Nearly on the Beach concert, and uh, Beatles Day, as I've mentioned. I'm not going to go into any details here, but this is, a, this is the start of my quantitative, which is the, the, the archival research. And what I've done here is I've tried to break down the number of performances. And you'll see from 1960 to 67, it looks quite good. That's because 
I've gone back and started again. <laughs> because I've, I've made arbitrary decisions about what is popular music. Mm. And what is popular music? Is it music that sells well? Is it music here on the radio? You know, what, what, is, what does it mean? You know, if you had a, you know, Italy, opera is popular music. If you had Portugal, Fado is popular music. So I decided not to make decisions. And I decided that, you know, if people want to go and see it and listen to it and enjoy it, it's popular music. And so I've gone back to the start. So I, this, again, this is work in progress. But what I think is, is interesting is how there was very little variety in what was being offered during the early part of the research period. That changed substantially as we, as we moved towards the end. And, and I decided, again, a really tricky thing for me to do is decide on um, what genres to capture. And in the end, I went with what's written down the bottom. You can probably see blues, brass band, classical, country and western, dance band, easy listening, folk, folk rock, jazz, light orchestral, minstrelsy, musical, musical theatre, opera, popular music, punk, reggae, rock and soul. Could have done loads more. You know, I could have gone progressive rock, funk, you know, glam rock. They could have, I could have you know, but I've chosen the 19. And that's the sort of start of the that piece of research. Um, things did change, you know, I've, I've already mentioned it, uh, things changed quite rapidly from 62 onwards. All of a sudden, interest in popular music in this area shifted away from light orchestral music, away from dance music. People started being interested and demanded, they wanted to see popular music. I hear some examples of some of the, um, the bands that play. And then in, um, in 67, you know, which some of you may remember the you know, the so-called Summer of Love, Hastings responded by putting on a <coughs> festival at the, the football ground in the, on the pilot field and um, with Dave D, Dozy B, B, and Tips, Higgins, Gina Washington and Arthur Brown. And then the following week in the Hastings Observer, it said, um, flower people and pop music, not to their tastes. <laughs> so there was, a, there was a massive backlash from the people in the area. And, uh, you know, they weren't very enthusiastic about having um, flower people uh, in their manner, as you can see. Okay. There was so much going on here during that time. You know, I'm going to put a few, this is, this is going to be a little quiz, actually, so this is a quick quiz. I'm going to put the pictures up first. So these are all musicians who played in this area during that period, 1960 to 85. And I thought, We'd have a little quiz, see so if you know who they were. So starting from top left. Springfield. Correct. It's Springfield. Incidentally, today, today in 1963, the Springfield split up. So it's split up today. It's the front page of the Melody Maker. The next one. No? It's Little Walter. Uh, it's a Little Walter. Yeah, we how was it? <coughs> He, he was a, you know, he's said to have been a big influence on Jimi Hendrix, and um, he played he played the Witch Doctor on the 16th of October 64. About a year later, he was dead. He, he got involved in that. He apparently he was a bit of a brawler, and he got involved in a pub fight in Chicago and, and sadly died. <coughs> he was a pretty young guy. Next, next one. Here we are. These are quite some of these are quite difficult because they are quite old pictures. It's actually Arthur Conley. So Arthur Conley's sweet song music. Um, again, played the Aquarius 71. Next to next, you'll probably get this one. They're a bit small. They yeah. are a bit small, yeah. yeah. I realise that now. We should have a few fewer and bigger. It's Gene Vincent. Um, Gene Vincent played Hastings Pier in September 63. <clears throat> next to him, if you can't see that, that's not a good one, but it's the Groundhogs. Oh, and uh, the Groundhogs played the Carlisle in April 85. Can you pick the next one out? Billy Bragg. Billy Bragg, yeah, Billy Bragg. Uh, played Rumours. I don't remember Rumours. Was that a club? Hastings, anyone remember Rumours? Anyway, it was, a, it, was a, it was there. Next one, next one. Is it down? Yeah. Jake Factory. Yeah, Jake Factory. <coughs> next to Jake? Nolan's, correct. Next to the Nolan's. Shack Attack. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Shack Attack played twice, so, uh, yeah, Shack Attack, White Rock. Next one, Mark Gilmond. Yeah, I think Mark's playing here, so yeah, yeah. 
And uh, next to Mark, Tia Sophia Perez. Next to next to them. Millie Small. It, it looks like Millie Small. It's actually Patricia Arnold, PP Arnold. Then we come down. Any thoughts? Stranglers. Stranglers, indeed. Is the Stranglers next to the Stranglers? That's the damned. Next to the damned? Lovey Sifri. Lovey Sifri, yeah. Lovey Sifri played twice uh, in the year that uh, won 74 and 75. And then, this is a trip one, the next one. It's an album cover. Oh, so it is RCB, yes. Oh, yeah. And RCB yeah. played the pier in 85. And six months later, they played here in Delaware. Next to RCB, sir. The Slits. It is the Slits. Yeah, the Slits supported the Clash. And, um, and many of you know, yes, Viv Albertine lived in Hastings for many years. And, um, okay, next to, next to the, come down to the bottom, bottom left. Again, probably a bit, a bit, it's not very clear, but it's actually Benny King, played the Aquarius. Next to him is Edwin Starr. Yeah. Next to him is Mary Wells, also played the Aquarius. Then next, any ideas about the band? It's actually the birds. But not with a Y, with an I. So it's, it's Ronnie, Ronnie Wood's first band, The Birds. Uh, next, next to them, probably again not really clear, is The Herd, Peter Frampton's band. Gary played The Witch Doctor in 66. And finally, that's Elkie Brooks. Yeah, so Elkie Brooks, long before she became John Vinegar Joe or became a solo artist, she she supported the Rockin' Berries at White Rock in 65. Sorry about this, I've frozen. What's emerging from, from the interviews, and it's quite an interesting story, really. And um, so, you know, why is why is this area so vibrant in terms of, of music? And um, some of the some of the, 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 some of the some of the things that are emerging from this piece of research is the university used this product called En Vivo. So you sort of kind of load all your your sound recordings into this software package, and it gives you an idea of what they think is important. And for this area, the cultural identity rooted in popular music is, is clearly a really important part of why music is, is, is so vibrant here. The fact there are so many venues, where people talk about being there could be as many as 100 venues that host live popular music in this area. <coughs> the fact there's so many musicians that, that live in this area, and I must have really high quality musicians that have chosen to live here and stay here. And, um, but the, you know, the, 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 it doesn't tell the whole story, you know, because the, the, one of the problems with, with something like En Vivo, which sort of, um, you know, it counts things, it uses algorithms, but what it doesn't do is it sort of doesn't allow you to express explain people's nuances, their passion, their enthusiasm. And one of the things that's very clear is that this area is, is incredibly creative. It's not just music, it's art, it's theatre, it's literature. It's an incredibly creative area. And that is all connected to the music scene. I also think it's, it's, it's very bohemian, this area. You know, and um, it's quite non-conformist. And I, I, one of my rabbit holes I went down was the sand ports. So the sand ports were, were established in, in 1050. And what happened was that the, the idea was that the, um, the, the fishing fleet in Hastings would protect the king. And they took, kind of did a deal. So the king basically said, you can kind of do what you want, really. You know, we don't have any laws. You know, you can, you can, it was almost, 
they became pirates. You know, they, they were, there was no there was no governance in the area, and, and I genuinely think that that's continued. I think there was a there, I think that it's, the area is fiercely proud of being non-conformist, bohemian, and different. You know, I think that's one of the one of the key themes that's come up through research. Okay, this is kind of more or less coming to an end now. So just, what, what, what remains to be done? Well, I've, you know, I've got to do a bit more. You know, I've got another year of this research to do. I've got to improve the quality of my um, archive. Um, I've got to analyse the data. And I, th I think there's an opportunity, I think, to, you know, I've mentioned some of the venues, but there's loads I've not mentioned. And the, I, I think this idea of maybe mapping out some of the characteristics of Hastings around some of these venues. There's also, is there a national or international context? When I went through old copies of the Melody Maiden, you know, New Music Express in, in the British Library, they only seem to be, during this period, they only seem to report on things that were happening in London or at festivals. There was nothing anywhere else in the country. So whether there is a national or international context, I'm not really sure. One thing that they did write about was Stallion. So Stallion um, won the, um, Melody Maker Awards in 1976, and they were front page of Melody Maker. But that was rare, because it was probably because the show was in London. You know, so there isn't really anything that's written about regional areas. But I'll go, I'm going to go back a little bit. I'm going to do one final ethnographic study, and I think it's going to be Fat Tuesday. I think it feels like a must. I didn't go last year because of my COVID fears. But I think this, this next year I'm going to try and get there. It's also a massive folk music scene that is untapped and not written about, and I want to do a bit more research there. And then finally to write the thesis, um, which I've got to do right about March. Um, so what's the impact of all this? So I think that the study will provide a unique perspective into the importance of live music as a leisure activity and help to explain the ways in which the community identity has become so deeply rooted in popular music. The results will demonstrate the value of using the archive of an ethnographic methodology to examine the way that histories are created and the impact that memory and nostalgia has for the local community. And the study will generate sufficient research data um, to potentially write a book, I think. It's a book, or certainly an exhibition. Um, I think there's a, you know, there is, a, there is an awful lot of interest, I think, in the area, and I think from I can tell from you coming tonight. I'm looking for my notes because I've got some thank yous. I want to thank a few people. Um, so I'm coming to an end. Coming to the end. Yeah, I just wanted to say a special thank you to and um, first to Dan Scales here at the Delaware Pavilion. Um, for suggesting hosting this event <coughs> and for helping making the arrangement and to, to Ed, Ed, of course, for the encouragement and support and the Dell for playing the music and Duncan for showing his incredible guitars. Um, I want to thank Jim Breeds, who's here, and um, for introducing me to so many amazing people who've helped me with my research. To Alan Asdell, um, otherwise known as DJ and broadcaster Johnny Mason, and the founder of the Smart Postbook Group, for providing me with so much useful research material and access to his radio interviews. To Colin Bell, um, who worked at the Pier Ballroom during the early years of my research period, for his insights and his friendship. To Archie Lachlan, um, for allowing me to view his amazing documentary appear and, and show it to my students at London College of Music. They absolutely loved it. Um, to Andy Gunton, who can't be here tonight, he's on holiday in Italy, um, but he's really so helpful to me with introductions and telling me about the subs interview. Um, my MA supervisor in Liverpool, Mike Bockham, who in 2017 drove from his home in Chester six and a half hours to meet me on the pier to discuss my ideas. Um, to my PhD supervisor, Dr. Tim Hughes, for his guidance. But finally, to all the musicians, music fans, promoters, DJs, venue owners, journalists, sound engineers, managers, local historians, filmmakers, archivists, librarians, and members of the Smart Facebook group who have generously given me their time and allowed me to interview them about this incredible town, its music, and its people.